I guess it's more introspective, but it's also a little bit more relevant for you as researchers um, to think about uh, and the kinds of things that you actually do on a day-to-day -day basis. And getting to uh, Daniela's comment about inversing the funnel or turning the funnel upside down, a little bit of the point of this talk is, is to think in terms of the kinds of things that science collaboration can do to address many of the things at the, at the policy level that are slow to respond, right? So instead of waiting for Daniela to fix the world, right, <laughs> and, and to make everybody understand what's going on, right, or for national governments to sort of bring everybody on board, which takes time, right, we can think about that as extremely important, right? And we can think about the sort of opening democracy of, of science up as extremely important. But in the meantime, and what you've seen today is a lot of advance in technology at an extremely ra uh, rapid rate. And so as scientists and as collaborators, do we sit here and wait or do we do something now, right? So that's kind of the point of, of the overall presentation. And it's in, and I'm giving it in, in two parts. Uh, one is, uh, uh, one part is trying to sort of present some of the technology uh, in a very poor way, I'm sure, but present some of the technology and what the implications are for organizations and in society and some of the ways I've been thinking about it and, and the ways in which uh, other people are thinking about it too. And the second part is really um, when we when we then bring that to collaboration, right? What are the trade-offs that we were that we're going to be making? I mean, we think about trade-offs at a society level, right? Where more information about whether or not gene drives affect s something in bio in the biodiversity, whether it's whether it's something that the nation wants or not, we can think about it that way. But every day, you're making trade-offs in what you do in the, in the laboratory as well. And, and as a collaborator, a member of a team, where everybody's different, you're also making trade-offs as a team. So that is a little bit about the presentation. So the first part is about technological change. And if we just think about the landscape, so certainly mobilization of diversity, super important, right? Um, mobilization of diversity and genetic resources uh, helps address really important critical problems. Um, the second point is that there's global institutions that have arisen, as we've heard about, that are sort of trying to facilitate the exchange of materials and data, mostly materials, right? And still keep in mind these issues of equity and fairness that we've heard about. But the institutions, right, have also fostered uh, a number of national regulations. And those are primarily focused on physical materials. And there's a lot of questions now about whether or not um, the physical material is the same as the data. It's the same as the, do the new technologies bring in a new era that makes some of these more uh, uh, difficult to sort of address. And when we think about this, the, there is essentially a difference potentially in the inputs to science instead of or in addition to the physical genetic resources you now have data and there are certain properties of data that are different and and as we saw in the in an earlier presentation there is this uh, potential uh, you know this this uh, mo um, 
dematerialization process, and it has and it has implications. So that's sort of the broad outline. There's three parts to this technological change that I think about. This is how I think about it, um, and this is written up in a in a, in a paper uh, that recently came out in New Phytologist, um, and the idea is that. Um, first, you have big data, right? And, and this is, you know, as a result of reducing costs, like we heard about before, there's a massive production of data. And there's tons of libraries that are coming up all over the place, right, in which digital information is being stored. And these repositories are numerous. They're very dispersed geographically. They're not in the old organizations, like uh, gene banks, necessarily. Um, there's new organizations. And there's rising demand for DSI, digital sequence information. The second piece is that it's not just about big data. Right? It's about integration of data across all of those different sites to gain some kind of advantage of that merger integration, plus the ability to analyze it. Right? So we've heard a lot about, um, about the anal analysis, but we really haven't heard much about sort of the bioinformatics part of this, you know, technological change. There's a lot going on there, and researchers can now screen huge amounts, large collections of big data. Well, that means, you know, from a social science perspective, and even from a valuation perspective, you can produce, you can get knowledge and information out of data without going at all to the physical material, and that is, you know, that's not really even getting into gene editing. That's just infor knowledge from these databases. So there's value to be extracted from the data in these huge libraries. And the third piece of this is the genome editing, right? Which we've heard a lot about, so I don't need to say anything about it. Here's three things that took me a long time to figure out. Uh, and there's really no need to go through them, but it's targeted cutting and pasting, right, of genes for different purposes. And that kind of, uh, uh, that kind of, of, of technological advance, uh, whether you think it's radical or not, fundamentally different or not, well, that's sort of debatable, but taking all three together, right, big data, screening, and genome editing, when, when, when socialist people who study te technology and innovation think about, think about whether technology is, you know, how do you distinguish across technologies from sort of incremental, which more like step stepwise changes that really don't disrupt social systems very much to radical changes like the steam engine, right, or the personal computer, which are considered more radical. You might want to think about this as uh, more radical because it actually is starting to disrupt things the treaty and, and the CVD, not really sure how to deal with data. The speed at which the change is happening is enormous. So these are, um, these are disruptive. And I, I kind of want to just talk to you about uh, three ways that, uh, that you can think about how disruptive these are. Um, and I don't know, they just help you get, they just give you some heuristics about what's going on that help me understand anyway. So if this is the way things were with materials and gene banks and private sector breeders and universities and farmers, and these are nodes, 
and different nodes are public or private, different sizes, you know, there may be uh, the, the size of the gene bank or the size of the power, or the size of the money. You have uh, some diversity, right? You have sort of the players that you already know, right? But in the new world, we've got a super complex system. Right, where you have data repositories and genomic centers and sequence companies and synthesis companies and bioinformatics services and probably a zillion other things going on. Plus you have, you have relationship changes. It's not just the exchange of material and knowledge in these, but you also have data and software and APIs that allow people to connect data sets without even connecting with people. Right, so you really do have a different kind of social system. You have different players and different re relationships. At least that's what I'm, I'm positing. You also have some differences in resource distribution, right? So if you think about nature and farms and global organizations and research organizations, international research and individual researchers, sort of the, the sort of the, the actors in traditional, in, 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 a, in a physical based uh, genetic resource system, right? You have a lot of material stored in nature and farms, right? And you don't have that much at individual researchers and projects. But that is changing dramatically. Farms don't have a lot of digital sequence data and individuals have tons of it. Christoph has tons of it that he doesn't share. That he's, and he shares the important stuff, they go into publications, but there's tons of stuff that he's got. And he has to figure out what to throw away, right? So this is different, right? Fundamentally different. And how do you sort of organize that? Well, what happens is you get differentiation of ways to organize data, right? And so when we've looked at different cases and how this is falling out, you have, you know, you have essentially two dimensions. One in which you've got uh, institutional capacity that can be high or low, where institutional capacity may be thought of as ability to block somebody or to provide access to data or the ability to uh, limit funding, right? Or to uh, enforce policies. Sort of, you could think about institutional capacity even as power, right? And then you have technical capacity, right? Which may be storage space, technical expertise, and so on. You get a big diversity, so if you're, uh, you have low technical capacity and low institutional capacity, you're a facilitator or a broker, maybe. And if you have high institutional capacity and high technical capacity, maybe you're producing, right? This may not be completely correct, but let's just say that what's happening is the massive amounts of data and the sophistication of what's going on are creating organizational models that are separating, separating things out. Now what that means is that some people on projects may be producers in some countries, some people may be aggregators, some people may be brokers, or you may have connections to organizations that are essentially producers or aggregators. You see, so you end up with this sort of more of a, more of a, um, a, a diverse system of actors. So at the end of this first part, you have a, you have a proliferation of data repositories and a multiplication of, of users. You have a decreased need to go back to the original material, right? And that makes it difficult to identify the source of the gene or the sequence. You have a lot of innovation pathways. Just the actors alone gives you this idea that a sequence can be moved around and used for different things. 
you have uh, a chain of transmission, means sending it to people, very difficult to track, it's not transparent. Um, you have a lot of actors, those actors don't have the same standards for, for uh, documenting data. Uh, they're not all identifying where the, whether the data is connected to a material and where the material comes from. You have uh, enormous value in aggregation and combination and integration. You heard Christoph's uh, talk and you saw the red and the yellow. Well, what if you have a red, yellow, blue, green? And how do you figure out what value the yellow is to that new? So you have, you have a lot of complexity there and the, and the benefits are not clear. And then you have a lot of different instruments. Daniela has 747 different global instruments. Well, that's, you know, certainly there's, there's data protection stuff going on. There's uh, copyright going on. There's lots of different new instruments, and it makes it more complex. And what that means is, I hate to say it, but it limits the ability of ABS or other regulations to actually be the limits the effectiveness of these regulations. We heard it in the last talk. We heard it in almost every talk. So that creates challenges for researchers because we live in a world in which, you know, they they've already, you know, you know, let the let the rabbit out of the hat, right? So we already have acknowledgement that equity is important, that fairness and safety are important, and innovation is important. All of these things are already out there, so we can't really sort of wait uh, for, um, for the next, for the next uh, treaty. So there's part two, collaboration. Um, and and this, these are quotes from Ben Martin who is an editor of Research Policy, and he's a, he lives in Britain, and he, uh, he thinks about collaboration a lot. An increasing proportion of knowledge production is carried out by collaborations, consortia, and networks, rather than by individual research organizations. An increasing requirement to involve a greater range of stakeholders in the research including public and major policy decisions. There's a shift from top-down approaches to policy to network steering approaches. Policies that involve a greater number, but also more heterogeneous actors. So collaboration is where the action is. There's a lot of different people. He's getting to this idea that as collaborators, you're developing policy. Well, when we then think about ourselves as the collaborators on a big project, right, there's all sorts of different perspectives, right? So, uh, and it's not just people from, you know, different parts of the world that have different perspectives. It's people with different training that have different Right? There's all sorts of different things that are going on. So if we just take one example here on a collaboration, ownership. We've heard about ownership, and uh, ownership is either dead or it's sort of half alive, or we're not quite sure what ownership is. But if I asked every one of you what ownership is, you'd all have a different answer. So data doesn't belong to those. Does data belong to those who create it? Or does it uh, belong to the people who can collect it? Or does it belong to those who have the expertise to analyze it? Or does it belong to those uh, who own the material from which it originates? Right? They're all very different perspectives. <coughs> so here's three different quotes and an addition of mine. So, uh, creators are not necessarily aware of all the multiple uses, profits, and other gains that can come from information they've posted. 
data may be public, semi-public, but this does not simplistically equate with full permission of being given for all uses. So data can be public, but that doesn't mean everybody gets to use it whenever and however they want. That's one approach. The interest, and this is the next one is more about health, but you can sort of fill in for agriculture. Interests of the patients must override commercial interests. Trial part participants can be seen as the ultimate owners of the data, right? And so here I've got, and what about farmers? On whose land the phenotype data are collected, on new varieties, or varieties they have managed over time, right? I, I couldn't find a quote on that. So. And then last, who is financing the collection and storage of data, right? Data that no one else can store and nearly no one cares about. Shouldn't, shouldn't they be able to have the data? This is a Microsoft employee. So you see there are very different perspectives and everybody has potentially, if you have a storage facility, you can store the same data as anybody else. All right, so there's, so that's a fundamental sort of issue, right, going on, because we're not really sure about ownership, and that's something that you have to figure out at a collaboration level. How do you own the data? Who owns it? Who do you share it with? What ownership rights do they have? Do you have licensing agreements with them to use the data for different purposes? So kind of related to that, which we've talked about before, and uh, I'm in the camp of, uh, you know, uh, openness is an interesting question to, to, to investigate. There's two logics in science that collide. One is this open science in the pursuit of knowledge logic that everybody who works on a collaboration believes in, believes strongly in. If you don't have sort of transparency, you don't let other people check what you've done, you actually don't have a research finding that's, uh, that's uh, collaborated, um, corroborated. Um, intellectual property and commercial exploit exploitation, that's another one. I mean, I come from, the, uh, from, from Arizona State University. When I try to collaborate with Salim, I have to go through the intellectual property people. And I have to write out, you know, Whatever Salim and I produce together, we co-own. And that's very difficult for Arizona State University to understand. They think that I should own everything. So you end up with this, so, so you have this world, right, in which these things are really s smashing together. And in addition, you have broad mantras from governments <laughs> talking about how important it is to have open data across the globe. It's this norm, right? And journals say if you don't publish the sequence, you can't publish the data, or you can't publish the paper anymore. So you have this openness dimension, but at the same time, scientists don't share their data, right? There's lots of scientists and breeders that refuse to share their data with other people openly unless they trust that person, unless they have an agreement with that person. So on the one hand, you have a logic, a broad logic about how important openness is, but you've got a whole bunch of privacy issues going on. A second, and, and all of these things have to be addressed at a collaboration level. The second thing is, Daniela talked about fragmentation and complexity. And yes, all these different countries, uh, and, and I was talking to uh, the woman from uh, Burkina today, and all these different countries, they have the same ABS principles in their mind, but how they implement it nationally and regionally and everything else and in the organizations differs. So if you want to go get material from somebody else, you're dealing with their understanding of what ABS is. You're not dealing with what, the, what, what some sort of general global consensus with scientific certainty. You have conflicting values and heterogeneity. 
this is a great group, super heterogeneous. We're all from different places. We all have different sort of backgrounds. You have different disciplines. Uh, I don't, anybody from private sector? I don't think we have a private sector here, but we're funded by private sector, some of us. Geosocial, there's people from all over the world with different, different cultures, different beliefs, different values. There's different scientific and technical human capital. So in any collaboration, particularly global collaborations that are research for development, that are agriculture related to uh, almost any part of the world, but you have developing country scientists and uh, northern country scientists involved in a research project, there's differences in scientific and technical human capital. And uh, that's true even on regular old projects in your country. Senior scientists will have very different capacities than, than junior scientists. The problem and the point is that when we think about this heterogeneity, right, when we think about these differences across all of us, and we, we know that it's very important to have heterogeneity for adaptation, for discovery, for innovation, right? So the more different ideas come together, the greater the, well, the theory is, the greater the outcome, right? But as soon as you get into higher heterogeneity, you're kind of, you drop in trust fast. Fast. I mean, it's it's uh, you add two or three different people to the group. Now, hmm, I don't know. Well, uh, I don't know if I want to give all my data to that person. And uh, you know, I think we're going to have to formalize this, and they're going to have to have some restrictions. You see, so, and you may not even know that person. And that person may be more ethical than you. A fourth conflict, right? Uh, data contribution conflicts. I really like this one because it gets to it gets to the collective versus private <coughs> returns for contribution and sharing. Let's say we all work on a on a project together and we're producing data and if we all contribute to the pot and we pull from the pot and we add to the pot and it's dynamic, wow, we've got something. Because when I add something, it goes back to my first comment, right? If I post data, other people can use it for different reasons. They can see different things in it. So the more I do that and the more I create a community that's dynamic, right, it's super exciting for science. But ultimately, you have to pull something out of that and publish. Or you have to pull something out of that and make a new product. So as a group of researchers, you have to reconcile that. At what point do you allow people to take things away? How forceful are you in pushing people to share? Should this be voluntary? Should it be required? Right? And so in a collaboration, it's like a mini world, right? So if you think about how, how important this is globally, and then you think how it's operationalized in your team, it's the same issues, right? Another really interesting point is that um, uh, contribution to the pot increases transparency. So you've got to have some confidence, right? So I'm going to put some data in there, and then, uh, you know, Salim takes a look at the data and he says, that is crap, right? Or I see what you did, you did it wrong. Or you have something, but it's not what you think it is. And then you have controversy, right? You have big issues. And, and the point is that you've got to be able to manage this, manage the conflict inside uh, of a collaboration to, to encourage people to want to continue to Contribute. Um, and then the last point on the conflicts is this uh, equity of access, right? And it goes back to this idea of openness. So I can provide, I can provide 
my social science data to everybody in this room. But only some of you can actually use it because you don't have, well, you don't have the interest maybe. But even if you had the interest, you may not have the theoretical background or the statistical training on uh, the kinds of things that are acceptable in, so in social science work or so on and so forth. So you can't take advantage of it. It's open. You have access. But you can't use it. So what do you do about that, right? Do you help in your project? Do you help people take advantage of their data? Do you build capacity? If it's very heterogeneous, hetero heterogeneous group with developing country scientists and, and uh, scientists from the US or, or, or EU, do you, do you develop specific plans for helping people use the data, right? Otherwise, access is not equitable. Okay, so blah, blah, blah. This is the practical next steps. Uh, I'm, I'm going to stop preaching here, but it's the practical next steps. So there's, there's four things. And the last presentation had five things. This is four things. But basically, you're supposed to produce creative outputs and societal outcomes, right? You're supposed to collaborate. That means integration, exchange, right? Uh, building trust, reciprocity, all those good things. You're supposed to build an organization, right, that reduces transaction costs, right, enhances sort of commons or collective action activities, right, uh, encourage people to share, to manage the heterogeneity of people. And then there's policy, where you have to comply with regulations and engage with the tensions of the policies. That's what you have to do in collaborations. And so it's not really anymore, unfortunately, like my father's world where he didn't have to worry about any of that. He got his grants, he did his research, didn't care about anything else but his research question. Uh, nowadays, you have to figure out, you know, what, what are you doing the research for? For whom? Right? Uh, do, do, uh, uh, are there are there particular? We heard today, you know, gene drive issues. Um, there's huge uh, societal investment in those things. And then, uh, in addition to those broad goals, you have specific questions for the collaboration on membership. What is the collaboration network boundary? Who is a member? Who is not? What access rights do members have? What responsibilities do they have? Data quality, documentation, etc. What about non-members? Uses and expected contributions. What are the agreed upon uses for, to facilitate access? Are there requirements or expectations for contribution? Ethics, fairness, and intellectual property. Are there ethical or fairness considerations for access and use that need to be addressed by the network? What processes are triggered uh, in cases of commercialization? And last, data management and sharing. How can the network govern its data? Does it need formal data policies, data management plan, data sharing plan? Who develops these? Is there, conven is there some sort of consensus uh, governance? And if you break those down into two areas, you really have governance instruments and complementary resources. You have governance instruments, which are about data policies and principles, data and management sharing plans. You have monitoring, consultate conflict resolution, right? Systems in, in collaborations. Um, and then complementary resources capacity building, technical expertise, software, data repository, data storage, technical, technical services, and it goes back to the four different kinds of, of, uh, of resources. So I hate to leave you with sort of um, that, but those last three slides are sort of the goals 
and the questions and the sort of categories that you've got to address as a collaboration to, to sort of not wait for the next version of the International Treaty, but to do these things and, the pr and, and implement the principles of the treaty and the CBD and other things that are relevant for your group, right, at the collaboration level. Thank you.